Everybody good? Good. And you? Good. Yeah. Yeah, that'll fit easily. That's good. This is exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Should I be preparing my skin tone now? No, no, you're fine. We'll sort of um, do it together. Okay, great. Okay. So just to, um, to kind of get started, I know we're still waiting on a few people to come in. Um, to, to, for anyone that doesn't know me or haven't, hasn't met me through Above Ground, uh, my name is Jen and I'm the, the marketing manager at Above Ground. So I know I've spoken to a lot of you on email, so nice to, nice to be actually kind of face-to-face -face meeting you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> screen to screen. Thank you for all your work. Oh, I thank you so it. much. That's wonderful. We're really excited. We've got Marta here with us, who's going to be leading the demo, and she's going to give you a little bit of an introduction to herself. Um, just to give you a little bit of structure about how we're going to be doing things today, just for the sake of um, making things a little bit easier for the, everyone to contribute and to be heard. Um, we're going to be actually muting people's mics and kind of turning off the cameras now for sharing until uh, just leaving Marta on. If you guys all want to use the chat to feel free to ask questions as we go along, um, putting out comments there, I can moderate help get those over to Marta. We have a Q&A session at the end that we'll be doing. So you have lots and lots of time to kind of ask about process, to kind of get some questions in there about um, uh, product, anything that you might need. Marta's going to be working on all of that and we're going to get to it for sure. Um, another quick note uh, is that um, at the end, we'll be giving you guys the coupon code that was mentioned. I know there were some questions, some eagerness about that. People wanted that discount code. So we're going to be sending that along in an email. And we're also going to be doing a draw for our beautiful Windsor and Newton Galleria acrylic collection there. Um, it's a beautiful box set and one lucky person out of our attendees here is going to be winning that and getting that sent out um, to them. So um, I'm going to shortly turn it over to Marta who can get started with an introduction about her background, tell you a little bit about herself. We could talk about the product and the project and uh, does that sound good Marta? Good? Great. Okay, <laughs> awesome. All right, so I'm just gonna, we're just gonna make sure everybody's get gets muted there. Uh, and we have most everybody here already, right? Yeah, I think we're, we're short about two people here, but we'll let them in as they come in and make sure that everybody, um, everybody gets set up. So no problem, somebody's running a little bit late. Okay, sounds good. Hi everybody, can you guys hear me good? Yes, thank okay. you. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> I know, I apologize, we're muting you and then I'm asking questions, yeah. it's not necessarily the <laughs> Um, so I'm really excited to be here today. Um, it's uh, my, I, I've been doing Zoom demos and teaching on Zoom, you know, since this whole thing started, but this is actually going to be my first kind of in-depth demo where we're kind of working on this um, pretty detailed project side by side. So I'm excited to see how it goes. And during our q and I welcome all feedback on what you loved and what you loved. No, I'm just kidding. You can tell me what you hated. <laughs> um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I am a New Jersey-based artist, uh, Central Jersey, kind of smack in the middle, close to um, Princeton, if any of you guys know where that is. Um, I um, work with TFAC as an artist, demoing for Windsor Newton and Liquitex. Uh, TFAC is a program that has about 20 something artists throughout North America. And some of you might have actually had a demo with the artist that's more local to you guys. I think it's Linda up there, right? Um, so she's probably maybe been to your store a couple of times. Um, aside from doing demos with TFAC, I'm also a creative director at a graphic design firm, which kind of allows me to work both ways. So in the studio kind of with my hands and then digitally. Um, I'm also an adjunct professor at some local colleges here where I teach both studio courses um, and also uh, digital courses. So again, working sort of both ways. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, 
and hopefully we'll kind of get to know you guys a little bit more during the Q&A. Um, as Jen mentioned, she's sort of going to be the moderator so that we can kind of get through everything smoothly instead of having kind of open dialogue like we would in person. Um, she'll kind of be looking through chat and if there's any questions that she can address right away, she will. If there's something that she thinks, um, you know, I should kind of address while we're working, uh, she'll kind of throw a question to me. Uh, otherwise, we can kind of save questions towards the end if that works for everybody. So, um, excited. <laughs> uh, so I have two cameras set up. Uh, one is this camera sort of with my face, just so you guys know who's talking at you. And then the other one, which I'll switch to um, kind of in a minute, um, is going to be kind of facing down so you can see the work area. Okay. And I, I'm not sure if you guys have an option of switching between one and the other, um, you may, but I think it probably be best uh, that we kind of stick with this one. So here's my hands and uh, those are the hands that are gonna be talking at you. Um, so just kind of to start, I wanted to um, introduce uh, the sort of Galleria acrylics that we're gonna be using. Um, they are part of Windsor Newton's line. Um, some of you, may have worked with them already. Um, I know that the store has been carrying them for some time and some of you may be new to them. So uh, I have a tube here of a Galleria acrylic that happens to be a uh, cadmium red hue. Um, and I'm just gonna sort of put it out just so we can kind of look at the consistency. Um, hopefully you guys are getting a good feel for that on camera. Um, so, you know, straight out of the tube, it has a sort of buttery consistency, what you'd be kind of used to with uh, an acrylic. Um, this would be considered its mass tone. Um, Galleria is considered a uh, high quality um, sort of student grade paint. And what that means is that um, they use the same pigments that a professional line would use. Um, and where there's a more expensive pigment, like for example, a cadmium, uh, they use what's called a hue. And a hue would be uh, sort of a mixture of pigments uh, that you know, are sort of very carefully selected um, and in combination make a color that is very similar to that single pigment that you're looking for. So in this case, uh, this hue is meant to very closely simulate a true cadmium. And you'll notice that um, straight out of the tube in its mass tone, it certainly does that. Um, when you start to do a drawdown to kind of see its qualities, you notice that it also has that characteristic quality of a cadmium, which is that it's very opaque, meaning that it doesn't have much transparency through it, to it. Where you start to see some differences is if you start to mix this uh, hue with other colors to create oranges, um, violets, you're going to start to see the bias, right? So because this isn't just a cadmium, it has several pigments mixed together to kind of behave like a cadmium. Um, you may see some, you know, underlying bias if one of those pigments happens to sort of uh, have a blue or violet undertone, you might see it shift that way. It's nothing that you shouldn't like about it. It's just something that you should anticipate about it. So the more you know kind of situation. Um, one of the things that you can do in order to change the sort of opacity is use something that we'll be playing with today, which is the gloss medium. You guys got that um, in the sort of kit, and we'll discuss that a little bit more, but sort of show you here. So if I dispense some of that gloss medium, what gloss medium basically is, is that same binder that's inside of the tube minus the pigment or the color. So where you saw that in my drawdown, I had very heavy opacity, barely any transparency, which is characteristic of a cadmium. When I mix it with that gloss medium and then do a drawdown, you notice that I'm starting to get a much more transparent finish. The more I add, the more transparent it becomes. And what I'm also doing is changing the way that it's gonna dry. So by adding that gloss medium, I'm sort of adjusting it from drying um, to a satin finish, which is characteristic of uh, the Galleria acrylics. It's gonna have more of a gloss sheen. So in that way, you can manipulate the opacity of your colors. All you're adding is that polymer resin that's already in the acrylic. So you're not in any way compromising how it's going to bind, which you do if you add water, right? Because we all know that water is what you use to clean up acrylics as well. 
So you never really want to add more than 10% water to your acrylic mixes. So the Galleria line has about 56 colors. Um, and what they're doing is kind of selecting the ones that you would use most. What you wouldn't have in there is some of those more nuanced colors that would be in the professional line, like the whole entire extended line of chronopidones or something like that. Um, and we'll talk about those sort of pigments in a second. Um, but the one thing to note from this is sometimes people assume that a student grade paint is going to have a less opaque color uh, because um, it has less pigment load. And that's really not true, so true for a professional line. It's more characteristic of the pigment itself. And there's a really easy way that you can determine that on the tubes. Um, so I'm gonna see if you guys can kind of see that on the camera. There's a little square on the back of the tube. And depending on how that square presents itself, um, is the opacity rating of the specific pigment in that tube. So maybe I'll show it on here, it might be a little bit easier. So this is a color chart for Galleria. And you notice that some of the colors will have a fully sort of filled in square, whereas other ones like this permanent magenta will have a completely open square. The open square means that it's parent of a pigment, whereas the completely filled in square means that it's a fully opaque pigment. So again, it's a pigment characteristic not necessarily whether or not they put a whole bunch of that pigment in the tube or not. Um, so that's just something to know. You guys will hear me kind of shuffling my uh, notes here because I wanna make sure that I stay on track and don't get too distracted with colors. Sometimes when you're looking at nice bright colors like this, you can sort of get into your own world, into your own space and not really consider that there's other people waiting to be informed about something. So I'm just gonna put that palette knife here into like sort of water. The one thing about acrylics is that they dry incredibly fast um, and we definitely don't want that. So uh, now that we kind of discussed the Galleria as an acrylic a little bit, it's consistency and then, um, you know, the opacity ratings and things like that. I think we can kind of take a look at um, what we have in that kit that you guys all should have gotten. So one of the first things that we'll look at is all of you guys should have gotten this uh, sort of little satchel that has um, the colors in it. Just gonna tear this open, my palette knife. Very well sealed. So I'm sure that none of you waited till now to open it for the big reveal. And when you opened it, you saw that you had um, a little bit of that gloss medium that we were just discussing. And then you have this process cyan, process yellow, process magenta. So now the first thing that I'll note is, you know, the name of a color, that's all it is, there's just a name, right? So you can call something flamingo pink if you wanted to or cotton candy. What really matters is what we just mentioned, that pigment that you're using. So these three colors are the ones that we're gonna be using today. Um, in addition, we'll use the other ones that were either sent to you or that you should have kind of come to the demo with, and we'll talk about that in a second. But just so you understand, this process magenta is just a name for the quinacridone pigment that they're using inside. And in the line at the store, you could get that same pigment in a permanent rose. So that might be a name of a color that you're more familiar with. And the same thing with this process yellow. It is just a Hansa pigment. That's a pigment that's used to make yellow. And it comes in the lemon yellow in the Galleria line. And the same thing with process cyan. It's a phthalo pigment or a phthalo blue. And Windsor blue is a really nice phthalo blue that you can use. So if you wanted to use that discount code later and um, potentially get more of these paints, if you really like the sort of uh, pigment tones that you're getting, that's the three that you can kind of get it in. And I can kind of say those again once we go into the Q&A. So you should have received three colors and the gloss medium. And then aside from that, um, you would have had a jar sent to you of yellow ochre and burnt umber. So I have those in tube, but you would have gotten little sort of jars um, of both colors. And then we kind of asked for you to come to the demo with a titanium white and an ivory black. Now acrylic is acrylic. So if you have the ivory black or titanium white in Galleria, that's great. But if you have it in a different acrylic that you've been using at home, that's certainly fine as well. So those are the colors that we're gonna be using. Additionally, what you received is a packet, two or three, I think, um, of the Windsor Newton watercolor paper. Um, so 
it kind of zips that bag, which would have worked great for that sort of damp pack that I sent an email about. Um, hopefully everybody got that. So this is the five by seven that we're actually going to be printing onto. Um, and when I sent an email a couple of days ago, probably about two, three days ago, asking that you guys prep this in what's called a damp pack. So here I have a sort of Ziploc bag. And all I did was kind of place those five by seven sheets inside after kind of wetting them. And there was two different ways that I kind of told you guys that you can do it. But again, they're just kind of staying in there to be wet. Okay. Now, you may be wondering why we're using watercolor paper uh, when we're- Hi, Marta, we just have a quick question here. Is that okay? Of course. Of course. Okay. So uh, Marie wants to know if she can squeeze each pouch into a small jar or would it uh, dry even if kept covered? So uh, with the satchels, right? Yes, um, that's right. Yep. So acrylics do dry when they're exposed to air. So certainly putting them into like the jars that you guys, similar to what you got sent um, with the ochre and the burnt umber, you'll be able to kind of keep them airtight. I've had success uh, if I keep my sort of threading clean um, and keeping acrylics for a very long time that way. Uh, the biggest problem comes when you're a sort of messy painter, which I will admit I tend to be. <laughs> and um, if you don't kind of make sure to clean that threading and that there's no paint kind of exposing it to air. But if you're good about kind of wiping down the threading, making sure that it seals nice and tight, then uh, you should be able to keep it indefinitely in there for sure. Yep. So the, the reason why we're using watercolor paper is um, you'll learn very quickly in this demo because we're, we're gonna you know, sort of be up against it, right? With acrylics. Um, if you've used acrylics before, you know that one of either the things you love about it or you complain about is that they dry very fast and they stick to everything, right? So watercolor paper um, has uh, an ability because it's for watercolors to absorb a lot. And by sort of damp packing it, we've allowed it to kind of open up those pores to really take on that acrylic so that it's helping kind of remove it off the plate that we're gonna be printing off. Uh, if you tried something very slick, you'd likely not be able to get the acrylic to lift off the plate that we're gonna be printing onto. Um, but essentially my kind of theory with acrylics is that you want to use the surface that would be best suited for the technique that you're going to be use, using because really acrylic will stick to anything. So in this example, when we're looking to kind of really kind of transfer a lot of image um, and build up that image, something like uh, you know a watercolor paper really works well. If we wanted to do lots of washes, a watercolor paper would work really well. If we wanted to work very heavy though with impasto marks and collaging in, um, we probably want something more rigid because we want it to be able to support the weight. So again, the, the surface that you choose to put your acrylics on isn't so much um, you know, a problem like with watercolor or oil where you have to really be concerned about it. It's more about what do you want that surface to do for you and will it kind of lend itself to the process that you're going to be um, using. And then you would have a five by seven photo of yourself um, that you either printed yourself or you kind of supplied it um, in enough time to above ground for them to kind of print for you. Um, and I will do my big reveal of my photo in a minute. Um, so the five by seven print, uh, we're gonna be using sort of underneath as a guide. And today we're doing portraits, but really, I mean, you could use a photo of anything, a landscape, a pet. Uh, what it does is give you a sort of blueprint to help kind of guide you on where to lay down colors. It's a really great way to work for somebody who's not particularly, um, you know, well versed in kind of the anatomy, or you don't feel very confident kind of painting from life, it's a really nice way to kind of um, almost have that template there for yourself. And then you should have also received a piece of plastic that you're going to lay on top of your image, which we're going to paint onto, um, and that could be something rigid or um, something more flexible. I think that you all received a piece of flexible um, plastic, uh, which will work just fine. And then you received uh, brushes. So I have sort of several different brushes here, but what you received would have been probably a number six 
Um, and I think a number four, which is a good size for the size that we're going to be working. You always wanna choose a brush that's going to work. It's not gonna to be too big for the size that you're working in where you can't get into the detail, but you also don't want something that is so small that you're focusing on the tiniest of little nose hairs, because um, that's not good either. So I think the sizes that we, we sort of sent you are gonna work really well. Um, and then there's a couple other things that you should have just at the ready, um, paper towels, uh, a cup with water, um, preferably also a spray bottle with some water in it for misting, masking tape, and then a palette knife, some kind of palette paper. I have that here, but you can also just use a piece of plastic. If you don't have anything, you could even use the sheet that this um, came in or um, that sort of uh, Galleria satchel. This is a perfect palette for today if you don't have one. Um, and uh, we also had some kind of either your palm if you're feeling extra strong or a spoon or some kind of roller for applying the pressure for transferring. Um, palette knife we've mentioned. Um, and then I actually asked for a little bit of dish soap and you'll see uh, what we're going to use that um, for. It's actually going to be, it's going to help with a bit of a resist. We're gonna lay that down onto our plastic so that um, that acrylic will want to lift off um, of the surface much easier. So does everybody have those things that we just kind of discussed? They may not be you know, in the order that I mentioned them, but they're at least somewhere within arm's reach so that we can kind of uh, work with it, right? Nobody needs a second to kind of run and get dish soap or anything, right? <laughs> Everybody's good. Okay. So I'm going to just move these over right here and do my big reveal. So there I am, look at that. And you thought you'd have to talk to my hands the whole time. So um, here I have my image and I'll talk about how I set it up. I just kind of wanted it there so that, um, you know, I can focus on kind of talking about it while uh, instead of struggling with any of it, you know, and having my arms in the way while I'm taping. So the one thing that I want to mention about mono printing is some of you may have done some portraiture and when you're painting direct, often what you do is you work loose and then you work in the detail. With mono printing, especially with acrylics, the detail really is something that you're not going to have to look forward to. Um, it's really not about perfection. It's about sort of creating a gesture of a portrait. So we're going to be working in sort of larger areas of light and shadow, um, but we're not going to be kind of focusing on the minutia of the small details and the perfection. That's something that with acrylics, once it dries or even while it's still wet, when you're done transferring, you can actually work back into and work those details in. Um, and I'll show some other things that you can do as well if you wanna work more mixed media uh, with your um, sort of gestural portrait. So again, we're not working to achieve perfection today. We're working to sort of achieve a gestural impression of a self-portrait. So nobody should be worried about those pesky details and nobody should be self-confident about their you know, eyeball being a little bit bigger than um, it should be or their nostril not quite being sharp enough, okay? <laughs> I know that for some of us, that's a little bit hard, um, but I think that the way to look at it is that it's almost freeing, right? Oftentimes we kind of get so self-conscious and focus on those little things so much. This is um, a way of painting that kind of frees you from all of that and allows you to just kind of express and gesture um, more freely the, um, you know, sort of the, the impression of a portrait. So I think we're ready to sort of set our work area if everybody's good to go. So you'll notice here, and this is just for the sake of um, me kind of working without going, you know, things moving around too much. Don't think that you had to bring a clipboard, but what I have here um, is a clipboard and that's just allowing me to sort of keep my plastic hmm. in place. Okay. Um, um, Roberta, sorry, just wait, one quick question. Yeah. Um, so Zan in the chat is just asking it, they missed how to lay out, uh, they say knock on door, but if yeah. there's a, if you could go back over that maybe quickly. Yeah, so which part okay. of it, I'm sorry? Uh, the layout knock on door. Sorry, Zan, can you, um, let's just <laughs> no clarify. <worries. laughs> Okay, um, I think it's the layout part 
that we just see a layout of the um the image yeah i think so um yeah. so we're gonna um the only thing that i've sort of just went over right now is just what you should have kind of um gotten in your kit but we haven't really gotten into how we're going to use those things okay. yet so much here we go okay so we have an answer. <laughs> so Dan is wondering if you put uh, the paper first and then photo and then plastic, but we, um, and then uh, Jerry's wondering if it's okay to add a little retarder to the water bottle. Yes, so um, all of those are great questions. So we're gonna, I'm gonna actually talk about the order of things right now um, in kind of setting up. So if you guys wanna work alongside of me now to kind of, prep your stations, that would work best. And that will answer the question about um, what goes first and in what order. Um, the slow dry medium or retarder in the water, yes, you can certainly do that. Um, and I was actually gonna mention, depending um, on the temperature in your room, right? So here's one of those variables with this workshop that may be completely magical on Zoom <laughs> or um, may have us kind of, you know, thinking through ideas on how to make it work. So ideally, when we're all in the same room, we can kind of gauge how dry the room is, um, you know, what, how, um, how quickly our acrylics are going to dry, how quickly we have to work. Uh, with us all being in separate rooms with different kind of thermostats and different comfort levels, we're all going to have a slight variation in that. So that's why I introduced the dish soap, which will help. Um, you can add a little bit of slow dry medium to your water. That will help as well. And I would actually say um, I would add that into whatever you're going to be dipping your brush in rather than what you're going to be spraying because the spray we're going to be using on the surface. Um, although there may be something to be said for that, because what happens when you spray the surface with just water, if any of you read that assignment or sort of project sheet that one of the TFAC artists, Peter, put together, he says to spray the surface with water. Uh, what can happen there is if you spray a little bit too much, it starts to dilute those colors and create even looser uh, lines and shapes than you would want. So something like a palette wetting spray is actually a really good thing to use here if you have something like that. Um, or that slow dry mix with water might work well as well. Um, but, but yeah, anything that you wanna play around with to see how it will help you, I think will be beneficial here. Um, it, in this process, it's a lot of experimentation. Um, you know, working in this area today with the temperature outside, I might have to make some adjustments from some of the studies that I was doing prior to the demo. So we're gonna be kind of figuring out alongside of uh, each other. Um, so with setting up, what I have here is I have my image, my, my photograph first. And what I've done is I've sort of taped it down just behind it, so you know that, uh, kind of way of taping photos. I just did a sort of loop with the tape. So I'm using painter's tape, but that's not necessary. Um, and I just kind of loop it. So it has a circle with all the tape sticky side around. And I placed it underneath my photo so that it's kind of not budging, okay? And I'll just put another piece just to kind of get, make sure that it's nice and secure. Now I'm working flat. So you guys can sort of see what I'm doing. Um, if you want to work at a slight raised angle, you can do that. The one thing that I will say is you will be applying a lot of pressure to try to lift the image off of the plastic onto the paper. So you want to make sure that you're working on a surface that you can apply that pressure to. So I wouldn't say painting on your knees probably won't work. Um, on a surface like a table would work best, okay? So now I have a rigid piece of acrylic just because it reflects light a little bit less for demo purposes, um, but your flexible film is just as fine. What you need is something that is not going to uh, want to stick to the acrylic. Um, so I'm clipping it here, uh, but you can tape yours down. Um, and by clipping it or taping it, what you're doing is not allowing it to move. Essentially, you're creating a sort of poor man's registration, right? In traditional printmaking, you would register your plate to where you're laying your paper down so that when you're doing subsequent prints, you kind of have it in the same area. What I've done here is I've sort of just put tape along the edges to define uh, where that plate ends just in case it does shift. I'll know where to kind of put it back and you already see that it's shifted a little bit. 
Okay. And then the other thing that I like to do, um, especially since I'm working on an oversized plate, your plates are the size of the image, um, is add a little bit of tape and it's actually three tape pieces deep. So it does create a little bit of a lip, nothing noticeable, but just enough um, around the sort of one edge, lower edge and one sort of side edge. So that I'm creating an area where when I take that paper, when I'm ready to print, okay, um, this is just a sample sheet, I'm not printing anything yet. I can almost lay it against those edges and it creates a bit of a resist. So when I try to kind of push it past, there's a bit of an edge. Now, again, in a true printmaking studio, we'd have a, a severely raised edge so that it really wouldn't slip at all. And it would be much more small than there. But for the sake of what we're doing, this works just fine. So however many pieces of tape you feel you need there, this side's a little bit low. So I'm just gonna add another piece. And all I'm doing essentially is creating that lip. So again, when I'm going to print on my dampened paper, we're going to sort of paint onto the plate first. And then when we're ready, we're going to lay our paper down, sort of registered to the edges, and then use our palm or the spoon or a roller, which I'll show, to apply pressure to then lift that image up, okay? Is everybody in a good spot? I know that I kind of had some of mine pre-assembled, so I don't wanna assume that everybody's kind of speeding through this. Um, maybe if you wanna sort of give thumbs up just to acknowledge, to, to, let, to let us know that you are in a good spot to kind of move to the next step. So, I have this little bowl here, it's nothing fancy. I'm pretty sure that somebody in my house has probably eaten out of it. And I have a habit of not marking things on what's art and what's not. So I'm sure that everybody in my house has a little bit of paint in their system. I'm just kidding, I would never do that. But this isn't so dangerous because what I'm doing is actually that dish soap that I said. So this is a dish soap. This is not like a brand, this is palm olive. It's not because it's better than any other Dawn or something like that. It just happens to be what um, I had around. The fact that it's pure and clear, I mean, does it make a difference? Really, this isn't necessarily archival or artist grade. It's just dish soap. So I think even if you had the, you know, blue smelly stuff, it would be perfectly fine. So I'm just adding a little bit here into the bowl. That way I have it sort of next to me as I'm working. And you um, can use any brush that you want. I mean, even really the same brush that you'd be using for your acrylics. Um, that's another trick that um, kind of worked for me when I had a particularly dry uh, space when I was doing some of the sort of prep work for this demo. I actually would dip my brush into um, the soap first and then work the acrylics a little bit, which helps it lift too. Again, what you're essentially creating is a, like a barrier cream, right? So I'm going to take that dish soap just as it is, not diluting it at all, and I'm just going to brush it on to that plastic. So I'm not you know, putting a thick, thick layer, but I'm just doing enough. And what it's doing is creating this thin film between what will be my acrylics and the plastic, which will, the idea is, is that it's going to allow me to lift the acrylics off. Because again, what we talked about just a little while ago is that those acrylics are gonna wanna stick to anything. Technically, I could paint onto this acrylic sheet, let it dry, and it wouldn't wanna come off. That could be my finished piece. But that's not what we're trying to do here. We're trying to get this acrylic paint to lift off of this plastic. So this dish soap is gonna help that happen. Hi Marta, we just have a quick question. Yeah. Uh, Tanya would like to know if there's any alternatives to dish soap that could be used. Um, I mean, dish soap works really well. Uh, traditionally, um, what you would be using um, in like a printmaking studio with like, let's say watercolor is um, gum Arabic. Again, it's just creating a barrier. I mean, I'm thinking that you could probably use maybe a little bit of like some kind of oil, although that wouldn't dry like a dish soap. Um, you know, I would stay away from, if you're, if you're asking about any artist material, um, I would try to stay away from anything acrylic based. So even that gloss gel that we talked about, technically that's the acrylic itself with no color. So by laying it down, I'm just creating a layer of sticky, right? Um, in sculpture, there are what's, what are called resists that you can get and they have that same kind of slick film to them and they'll dry and coat. But if I have to be honest, all the sculpture studios that I've worked in, they've also used this soap a lot. 
So <laughs> it's kind of like the least harmful way of kind of creating a resist. Although it's not archival, it's, it's really not in any way affecting the paints and acrylics dry to a plastic sheen anyway and finish, um, that, that soap's not gonna do anything to them. Okay, so what? a few quick questions again too. No, no so, uh, Eva just wants to confirm. So the dish soap is mixed with a little bit of water, is that right? I didn't mix it at all to lay it down. No, no mixing? Okay. I didn't, um, just because I want that film to be nice and thick. Although right. you'll notice that as I'm working, um, my paintbrush will be a little bit wet, so this will get a little bit sudier. If it's wet and it bubbles, it will dry just fine. The reason why I'm using it undiluted is because I want a nice film on there. Great. And uh, Jerry's wondering if you're familiar with Speedball Pink Soap and if, if that would be okay to use. Yeah, I would think so. I mean, I'm not particularly familiar with it, but I'm assuming that if Speedball makes it, they're either using it to as a resist or they're using it to clean up their um, ink, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So either way, yes, it would work. Any kind of soap. Okay. Yeah. Any kind of soap, great. Yeah, really, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, I should probably specify that. Dish soap just happens to be, in my house, we all use bar soap. And I didn't want to come out here with like a bar, although you could probably do that as well, kind of just buff your surface with like a bar soap. Um, so it just happened to work for me to have dish soap. But yes, any kind of soap uh, should work. And okay, if so one, any liquid soap, they should be good to go. Yep. Perfect. Okay, perfect. So we have the um, our sort of plate. It should be securely positioned. If you don't have a clip, you can just tape it, right? So you're kind of taping it in place. The plate and the image is not gonna move at all while we're working. The idea is that it doesn't move at all. So the more tape you use, the better. You want it to kind of be down there and not move, okay? So we've taped down our photo. We've put the sort of plastic over our photo and secured it so that it wouldn't um, sort of shift. We're gonna have our damp pack so our sort of pack of damp paper at the ready. So next to us, we're not gonna pull that until we're ready to pull a print, but we wanna make sure that it's somewhere within sort of, you know, hands reach, because you are gonna wanna do that pull as soon as you're ready to pull it. The less time the acrylics have to dry on your surface, the better, okay? Um, and then you're going to, uh, so we did the sort of soapy water with the, with the, um, with the brush. You're gonna um, make sure that you have a cup with water and paper towels nearby, because we are gonna make sure that our brushes stay nice and clean. And we're gonna, we're ready to sort of start laying our color out on our palette, okay? So can everybody see my, I know that you're, I'm kind of working with a larger space, but I, so if you notice all the other tape marks, these are sort of, if you can imagine um, being on set, this is sort of where I have to stand. I have tape down to tell me that I can't move past this area, which, if you've ever seen uh, my in-person demos, it's a really hard concept for me because I tend to, if you give me a table, I take up the table. So I have a very small table to work with. So here's my palette paper. I've only taped that down for myself so that I don't kind of start knocking it off. Um, if that works for you, that's fine. If not, you don't have to do that. And what I'm gonna do is just start opening up my satchel ricotta color. I'm using scissors, but I mean, Technically, these little perp lines should allow them to tear. So I'm just kind of cutting the corners. Another way, somebody asked earlier if they can put these in little jars. Another way of doing it, if, if you want, you can kind of, once you squeezed out the color on here um, and you have color left, you can just put all these in Ziploc bags and that should work just fine as well. Again, what you're, what you're attempting to do is sort of lock out um, any air in getting in there, okay? So I'm just going to kind of squeeze out my three satchels that came in. You really don't need for this small of a working area, I would say, just so that you're not running out of paint or feeling like you have to conserve, I would say maybe squeeze out half the packet. Um, you know, I always say it's better to kind of have more than enough than not enough. So I'm gonna lay down my colors here. I'm gonna move these over because inevitably if I don't move them over now, I'm gonna stick my elbow in them. I'll probably still stick my elbow in them, but at least this way I'm making a valid attempt at not sticking my elbow in them. So here I'm gonna just lay out the rest of my colors. So we should have um, a bit of burnt umber. 
I'm going to put out some a little bit of black next to my burnt umber. And again, the order that I'm doing this, some artists are very particular about where they put what colors. And I'd love to pretend that I'm that organized, but oftentimes what ends up happening on our palette becomes sort of mind of its own anyway. So I will say that because I'm going to be using my ochre and white sort of more closely and then my umber and my black more closely, I did sort of lay those out together. Um, but if you didn't do that, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to start over. What I do do is kind of leave this center bit open, obviously, so that I can start kind of creating my mixes. And I'm going to take one of my um, sort of palette knives. And I'm just going to kind of give you guys a second to make sure everybody has their sort of colors down. So again, we should have our um, sort of primary. So we have blue, red, and yellow. And then we have our white, our ochre, umber, and black. And what we're going to start with, actually, you know what? What, we, what we'll do as well, just so you have it out on your palette, is that gloss medium that came. Now, I mentioned earlier that the gloss medium is good for sort of changing um, the opacity of a color, as well as adding a sort of gloss finish. Because we're kind of painting over our image here, changing the opacity might actually be a nice thing, right? Because we're able to then kind of make the color um, transparent enough where we can still see our image under. Now, I don't know if um, you guys did, I know that we, it was kind of in conversation in the planning, but you may have received possibly two images and Jen, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but two photos of yourself. No, sorry. Uh, we, we just did one for Perfect. most people. Most people just went with one. There were one or two that had specifically requested two. So they're they're set to go if you want to just like show what that would yeah. be. But um, but everyone's got one for the most part that submitted them. Okay, perfect. So if you have if you do have two uh, images, so basically two photos of yourself, you could kind of tape one off to the side as a reference, right? Now this is working a little bit more sort of traditionally in the sense that you're looking, you don't necessarily have a direct reference, um, but we'll be working sort of transparent enough and in subsequent layers where you won't have that problem of kind of masking what you're looking at and not being able to see what you're going to paint. Now, if you read that project sheet that um, Peter wrote, um, Peter did mention that he kind of does all the painting in one session and then does the print. Now, if you want to do this project sort of outside of this demo um, alone, that's perfectly fine. You can kind of gauge how quickly your acrylics are drying. Uh, what we'll be doing today is kind of doing the registered prints, so subsequent mono prints of the different grades of shadow and light, which will allow us to kind of get an impression because we're painting for much less time and the paint doesn't have as much time to dry. Um, but that will also allow us to sort of see the image that we're painting a lot better. Um, so again, with Peter's sort of instructions, he had you painting everything all at once, covering the whole entire image, and then doing one print. We're going to be using our kind of registration here to pull subsequent prints to build up our image. It's still, called, it's still mono printing because we're not kind of carving or etching a print uh, plate that we can reuse. We're still just laying down color, lifting it, and then it's not there anymore. So every print that you make is going to be slightly different, which is what makes it a mono or single print. Okay, so what I'm going to start doing here on my palette is I'm going to just take my red and my yellow. And what I'm doing here is I am mixing a um, sort of foundational color. So I'm going to mix like a sort of mid to dark value that I can then um, sort of shift, you know, either lighter or darker. And I'll show you how I'm going to do that. Um, but because everything is going to be sort of stemming off of this, what we're achieving is kind of a uniformly created palette. So nothing in our subsequent print is going to feel out of place temperature wise because we're working with a very limited palette. All of the colors that we're gonna be using are gonna be created from these colors that you see here. So I essentially for myself and, and my sort of skin tone, I've taken um, sort of half and half of the yellow and the red. Um, if you, you know, want to follow the sort of skin tone brochure that we sent in the email to create the colors, 
um, you certainly can. You would just kind of either add a little bit more blue or a little bit less red, depending on um, which skin tone you're looking to achieve. So if you want something a little bit less sort of pink and a little bit more tan, um, you would adjust the colors accordingly. If you have darker complexions, you may want to add a little bit of umber or black to your mix. Um, adding a little bit of ochre, which I'll do in a second, will also turn it down. So right now you might be thinking like, lady, you are not orange. We're not there yet, don't worry. So I'm gonna add a little bit of the blue just to kind of tone that down. And a little bit of my ochre. So you notice that by adding that blue and adding a little bit of that ochre, not only have I completely toned this down, but it's also starting to head into a sort of more uh, believable direction, right? <laughs> okay. So again, and you wanna make sure that when you're mixing with your palette knife, you don't wanna mix with your brush, okay? When you're mixing with your palette knife, you notice that I'm scraping a lot because I want to make sure that I'm really kind of pulling up everything that's down below and, and getting a nice good mix, okay? Don't mind my palette knife here kind of flaking off. You can tell that I've been using these for quite a while. Okay, so I'm going to leave that there for a second. I'm going to take a paper towel and just wipe off my palette my palette knife. And now what I'm gonna do is just pull a little bit of this out, leave it down here. And I'm gonna pull a little bit of white and start adding it in. And I'm starting to kind of work with my skin tone. Now to me, this would be the sort of, probably the darkest of my lights, right? I'm fairly, um, I have a fairly light complexion. Now, if I feel that this is going um, a little bit too drab, I can add a pinch of red to it. And as I'm adding subsequent white, I'm kind of lightening up that mix. If you feel that the uh, mix that you're making is sort of going a little bit too pink, you can add a little bit of the ochre. If you feel like it's not going kind of pink enough, you can add a little bit of red. Adding a bit more blue and some of that black or umber will kind of give you a nice darker complexions. Now, in order to mix my um, sort of uh, shadows, what I like to do is not just use the black itself, but actually mix to the side a nice violet. So I'm going to take sort of the red and the blue and kind of mix a, a violet here. And then mix in some of the black and a little bit of umber. Now, again, even on that sort of sheet that we sent out, nothing's a science here, right? Like we're using the same sort of colors. So in the end, we're gonna have similar palettes, but you know, the way that um, portraiture works is it's not about kind of figuring out the minutia of the exact color of the skin tone. It's just making sure that you have the right value system and the right temperature, right? So as long as you have a good sort of scale of range in your sort of, um, you know, skin tone here and they relate nicely to each other. And then you notice that what I'm mixing here for my shadows is using the same exact limited pigments. Um, there's really no way that you can go wrong because everything stems from the same sort of base of uh, a palette. Where the problems arise is if you start buying, you know, two paints of very specific colors and thinking that you're gonna match a tube paint to a specific tone on the face. Um, it's always best to kind of work from a limited palette. So now watch what happens when I take a little bit of this um, sort of color that I've mixed here to shade down my color here. So I'm gonna just take a little bit of that.
So what I've essentially created here is a nice toned down. I've really kind of taken that punch out of that original color and I've created a nice kind of color to use in all of these areas where I have that sort of shadow. Now the photo that I chose um, has, you notice a lot of nice kind of mid-tones. It's a little bit blown out because of the light in here, but um, I do have some sort of a little, some high contrast sort of areas here where the light's hitting me directly on the hair. Um, but we have nice sort of transitions between the sort of shadows and the mids and the lights. So you have a nice sort of range in that photo. So if any of you do have that slow dry medium that you use, putting a little bit on your palette here and kind of using it to kind of mix with your colors probably will help it with lifting, although it's not necessarily, um, you know, a, a sort of be all end all. Um, the other thing that you can do is if you had a sort of palette wetting spray, you can kind of use that to mist your colors now. Uh, palette wetting spray, all it does is kind of keep your paints um, open and wet longer. And you can actually spray a painting with that or the, the paints uh, themselves. I'm gonna grab one of my brushes here. And now that I have my colors mixed, I'm going to go ahead and sort of lay down um, just the sort of uh, shadows of the darks. Now I'm gonna use both this sort of violet that I've created, this black violet, and this sort of uh, darker color here. So I like to use this sort of darker violet just in those sort of dark, darkest of dark areas, right? Um, and here you'll notice that what we're gonna be doing is kind of creating, almost working in a sort of additive and subtractive way. So I'm starting to lay this in. So here I have the sort of, uh, you know, shadow here, right here inside of the sort of where the, that kind of nook is where the eye hits. And you see that I'm laying down a very transparent veil. So I've actually not mixed any of my um, gloss medium, but you can certainly do that as well. Uh, I'm gonna kind of hit this brow shape and look that I'm not being, my brush is just the right size. I don't have to be very precise with, you know, kind of defining the brow. I'm just kind of placing it in the general shape because we're gonna be working in sort of subsequent layers. So if I feel like I've kind of over-exaggerated something, I can always go back in and sort of lay something over it. Now, this little area here underneath the eye, I'm gonna kind of do in my um, kind of shadowy brown that I've mixed here, but here in, in the nose, I'm gonna kind of lay in some of that violet. Now I'm gonna softly whisk with my brush this sort of area, but I'm gonna come back in with that brown, but just to kind of define that area sort of on the lip here. So again, you don't wanna use those sort of, uh, you know, true blacks or dark colors. This, your lip is never gonna be hot pink and that shadow that it's sort of cast in its nook is never going to be true black. Um, and that's sort of the benefit of kind of mixing your colors as well is that you're defining a more rich uh, color that's more true to the uh, entire palette. Now, the one thing that you don't want to sort of forget doing is also placing that color in the hair, right? So is my hair purple? No. Is my hair, you know, sort of magenta? No. But again, we're sort of creating an impression, right? So we're not going to be so worried about kind of mixing, um, you know, exactly the, the colors that we think our hair is, we're, we're creating a sort of impression. Essentially, I mean, if you've ever looked at, um, followed Jimmy, who's our resident artist on Instagram, uh, you know, his portraits, he'll paint with, you know, sort of chronophodones straight out of the tube uh, with really kind of vibrant colors. And the reason why they work is because essentially what he's concerned about is the temperature and the value shifts rather than uh, kind of representing the true colors. So I'm just kind of laying that in very loosely. You can kind of see um, if you feel like you've kind of added too much or if your paint's too loose, you notice that I'm kind of also thinking about the background here. I'm gonna take some of that brown now. Still working with the shadows. Just gonna go in and sort of right here under the eye where I was mentioning. Now this whole entire cheek here is sort of in the shadow of my hair. So I'm gonna lay down some of that lighter shadow that I have. Same thing with this cheek. Now this is particularly my cheek. That doesn't mean that you should be doing that with your cheek. Again, we're all working off of your own sort of portraits. And again, I'm gonna use some of that in the hair too.
So if you feel like you've sort of added a bit too much color somewhere or not enough, um, you can kind of manipulate it with your brush. Again, we're kind of working on a surface, right? So you can kind of almost move it around on that plastic a bit. Don't forget that kind of area underneath your nose. See, now I feel like that just went way too dark. So what I'm gonna do is take a dry brush and work sort of in a subtractive way. So I'm sure we're gonna get that right off. Look at that. Didn't even happen. So I'm gonna make sure that I'm kind of really considering the kind of values that I'm placing in there. So here I go. I'm gonna add a little bit of that there. Give myself a little mustache there. Okay. And now I don't wanna obsess with this. So I'm gonna kind of now, I wanna pull my first print to see what I've achieved here, okay? And I also don't wanna give my paints a little bit too, too much time to dry, okay? So again, I'm gonna do that there. I'm gonna put my paintbrush in my cup of water so that they can not dry up on me. Now I'm gonna grab my first sheet out of my damp pack. Okay, so now what you're looking for is if you pulled your sheet, it should feel damp to the touch. You should not see a sheen on it. If you see a sheen on it, it's a little bit too wet. That means that the water is actually sitting on the surface a bit. So you can just take a paper towel and almost blot it. Okay, make sure that it's just damp, not kind of glossing over with water. And I'm going to take my um, sheet and I'm gonna kind of bump it up against that edge that I have there. Now you guys have a little bit of a easier time because Technically your plastic's only the size of the sheet. So you can almost use the plastic as the registration. I'm just gonna tap it a little bit, not because I'm knocking on the acrylic or you know, kind of talking to it, although maybe, um, but just to kind of get it to tap down. And because we don't have a heavy layer of acrylic there, you do wanna kind of hold it. So now there's two ways that you can kind of start to work this. So you can either use the kind of palm or the knuckles of your hand and kind of push down, making sure that you're not kind of lifting or shifting it. You can use the back of that spoon. If you have sort of rollers like this for printmaking, you can kind of do that. And I would say apply pressure, okay? So now I might actually even stand up to really kind of give it some pressure, okay? Now, once it taps down, depending on what you're using, using this roller kind of allows me to not still hold on to it, but you wanna kind of get a feel of whether it's tapping or not. So what we're gonna do is kind of lift this now. Remember we have registration. So if we feel like it's not lifting very well, we can always lay it back down, okay? So can everybody see that? I've kind of made my first impression laying down my darks. I'll try to lay that down so you guys can get a good focus on it. There, you can see it almost when I put it at an angle better because there is a bit of that wet paint that's kind of reflecting. But what I have is some of those darker areas laid in. I have the impression of my nose, the sort of darkness in my lip, my chin. There's a bit of a sort of ghosting of my hair so that we're not just having a floating head on there, okay? So now, if you were able to kind of lift all that color up like that, that's perfect. If you feel like you still see a lot, like you can kind of see it on my plate a bit. There's a little bit here in the hair, some in the lip, not all of it has sort of lifted, a little bit of that darkness here in that eye. Now we can go back in with our darks after, but if you feel like you still had a lot left here on this um, plate that you wanted to lift up because your colors were drying faster than you would have wanted, this is where you can either take that sort of bottle. So here I just have a fancy sort of mist bottle um, with water and kind of very carefully mist it because you don't want it to get so wet that it's gonna start to bead, right? But you're just trying to kind of get it to lift. So you can either spray it with the water a little bit, or if you have that sort of palette spray, you can use that palette spray, okay? And I'm just kind of laying a little bit of a layer and then I can lay that image back down. Again, I'm registering it. So making sure that my edges line up. This is gonna make ensure that I'm kind of getting the image in the same exact spot that I had it originally. If you wanna focus on that area that wasn't lifting before, this would be you know, a good sort of strategy to do. You can see that I got a little bit more color on there, okay? Now, remember acrylic sticks to acrylic. So between sort of layers of color, we are gonna wanna wipe down our sort of sheet to kind of get that color off. If you feel like you're having a difficult time getting it off, that's where you can also kind of mist it with some water.
And then I'm gonna, again, take my brush with the soap. Now you probably still have a good layer of soap on there, but I don't wanna, if it's working, I wanna keep it working, right? And what the soap is doing is creating that barrier. So, you know, you have to remember too that a lot of different, the different colors also, different pigments will kind of wanna stick on there a little bit more. When we start getting into those colors that we've mixed with the white, we're gonna start getting a little bit more resistance just because that titanium white wants to kind of dry a little bit quicker. So hopefully everybody's kind of gotten their first pull. They're kind of getting a sense of what they're doing here. Everybody's good. There's not a whole bunch of questions that Jen is just trying to kind of navigate through. We're good. No, no questions yet. But if anyone's got anything, please feel free to send them <laughs> over. OK, perfect. So what I'm going to do now is I'm satisfied with um, the sort of darks that I laid in for my initial layer. So I'm going to move into my sort of um, just laying out some of those sort of darker lights so that transition from the sort of um, dark to the light around here on the forehead. I'm not gonna sort of do anything in the center yet, kind of start defining the nose a little bit, that layer underneath. Um, and this is where you start to kind of almost improvise a little bit, right? So I have this color here that I've kind of created. I feel like it's going a little bit too light. So I think I'm gonna pull from that kind of original kind of mother color that we've created, right? And add a little bit of that gloss medium just to kind of help it have a little bit of more of a flow. And I'm gonna start laying that in. So now I'm working on top of this, again, coated with dish soap um, sort of surface. I'm gonna start kind of laying that in. Now I'm not, I'm avoiding this sort of area. I think that may be some here in here. Again, I'm gonna kind of make sure that I also touch on the hair a bit. I, I kind of tend to force myself uh, to kind of work a little bit on the background and the hair with those colors because what ends up happening is there, you end up getting a nice kind of mix, you know, um, where it ends up giving you a nice kind of gesture of that kind of hair without kind of focusing on it too much. But you also, again, don't wanna kind of think about it towards the end because then it just falls flat. This way you're kind of building up that dimension. Um, so here I have a kind of a little bit of a light hot spot but around that area, I'm gonna kind of go in there a bit. There's a little bit of a kind of lightness on the top of my eye there. And again, don't worry about the fine details because what's gonna end up happening is when this color sort of lifts, you are gonna get a little bit of a softer line. So, you know, being concerned with the sort of under lip uh, underneath my sort of iris is a little bit too, too much detail for this kind of method, okay? This is where we start kind of hyper focusing on what we're doing and going radio silent on this one. I have to say though, it is it is a little bit different working this way without kind of being able to just look up and see your faces to see if you're all kind of enjoying working alongside of me or you know kind of cursing my name at the at the camera. Okay, so I'm going to kind of go in here a little bit. I'm going to mix a little bit more of this kind of darker tone just because I do feel it's a little bit too light for some of those areas that are kind of getting a little bit light and someone's going a little bit red. So here in this area, there we go. So again, you're kind of working with those mixes that you've made and creating kind of slight variations without kind of going back to the tube, right? Because we have a good foundation sort of laid down on our palette. Make sure that we don't kind of forget about our neck here. And you'll notice that I kind of, because I have these sort of heavy contrast areas, I, I have a lot of areas that I can kind of cover with this. Some of you, depending on how you took your photo, you may have um, sort of less of an area. Um, so again, it, it really all depends on, on your photograph, okay? So again, I'm gonna kind of lay my uh, brush into the water, move it around a bit, make sure I'm really getting that color off of there. And then I'm going to take my same sheet, okay? So I have my sort of darks on there. I'm going to lay it again, registering it along the edges here. And you see, you're, you're trying to work fairly quick, right? Because you're not only attempting to kind of build up this portrait, here I have a different size roller, which kind of helps me target those certain areas.
So I know that some artists that use this method say that there's like a magic time that you want to leave it down so that it has enough time to sort of adhere to the paper and release from the plastic. I think that's just a whole bunch of magic talk. I think that if you wait long enough, you'll have them stuck together. So there you start seeing that I'm kind of working in some of those sort of darker lights. So you start to see that, you know, the kind of bridge of my nose is starting to get defined. I'm starting to get a little bit of definition here underneath the eye. Okay, but again, we're working in a very sort of gestural way. Okay. So I do, I feel like I've gotten enough lift here, but you can see that because of the addition of that sort of titanium, I'm starting to get a lot more kind of um, color staying on the plate. Um, so how is everybody doing with their plates? Is everybody's plates sort of lifting well or is anybody banging their head against their plate yet? No banging? Great. I feel like we should have some like uh, music playing or something in the background to really set the mood. So what I'm doing here is just coating it with soap again. Now, if you want to be sort of brave and try it without the soap and get a good lift, you may very well be successful. Um, I just know that most of the sort of spaces that I work in tend to run very dry. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't work well for my headaches, but that's just that, you know part of the, the sort of space that I exist in. Um, so I know that I have to lay down that sort of soap if I want to get any kind of lift off this plate. Um, but we if you're, oh. yeah. Sorry, Martin. We just have a quick comment from Julia. She mentioned yeah. that hers. She forgot to to add the medium, so she's um, she said blogging a little bit, but I think I'm not sure if it's blogging is the right word. But um, so is it like uh, almost you're getting like plat like splotches? Yeah, I think that's that's where we're what she's. Uh, she's mm -hmm. mentioned, yeah, she says that's right. So any advice on that, if that can be corrected or if it's more like a, you're just gonna have to work with it, how do you? No, I mean, I think that um, if you, so as far as medium, you mean that gloss medium sort of on the side? I think that um, there's two things that you can do. One, if, you're, if you feel like you're getting kind of the color sitting too much on the paper when you're kind of transferring it, some of that may be that your paper is not damp enough. So again, there's like a fine line because you want the paper to be open enough where it's kind of accepting the, the acrylic, but not so wet that it's either not because it's already fully saturated or that it kind of bleeds uh, almost like a watercolor. So that could be it. Um, the other thing is the you can now subsequently add the sort of medium on there. And then also, if you notice, the way that I'm painting is very thin. So it's not just transparent because of the medium that I'm adding, but also I'm kind of doing very thin veils of color because I wanna build up um, the sort of uh, tones there. So I don't know if it's translating because I know that with the wet paints a little bit, but you can almost see that um, even in the areas that I've added that sort of second uh, print, you can still see the colors that I've printed underneath. Um, so there's, it's almost like you're laying transparent on top of transparent in the paint load as well, not just by adding the medium. I, I don't know if that answers the question a little bit. Yeah, I think Julia did mention that she, she sees that her paper is drying out a little bit. So I think it was very helpful. Yeah, you can, um, and I feel free to miss it. Like if you feel like you wanna miss the paper, um, maybe on the backside, the paper is very absorbent because it's watercolor paper. So missing on the backside that we're not printing on and then tapping it will kind of give it a little bit more moisture. And then um, we have a, uh, just a comment from Anupa yeah. who mentions that she uh, is um, following the process, but not, finding that it's not lifting super well either. So not sure where the, the issue could be there, but. Yeah, I think that a lot of it's sort of um, in that drying time, right? So uh, making sure that you have a nice good layer of that, is she using dish soap? So if you're using dish soap, you're gonna have a nice um, sort of layer of dish soap on there. If you still feel like it's not lifting very well, it could be the pressure aspect, or you can actually um, maybe, you know, have a little bit of diluted dish soap and almost use that um, in with kind of on your brush to kind of mix with the paints too, because then it will kind of almost make the paints 
a little bit more resistant to sticking to the uh, acrylic. So again, any trick that works. But that, that dish soap, if you're using it, really is the, the magic sort of key that I found. So I'm going to, now I have two sort of layers printed on there. I'm gonna go in um, again with a lighter color and kind of hit those areas that um, you know I feel like I, I hadn't with my sort of darker tone. So I'm gonna start sort of this kind of bridge of my forehead a little bit. Okay, I do have this kind of lightness on my eye. Yeah, this is certainly not the best uh, project to do if you want to sort of look for imperfections in your face. <laughs> kind of really kind of focusing in there on the droop of your eye and there we go. So I'm going to kind of go down the, the bridge of my nose here, make sure that I get this kind of area here. I have this hot sort of light spot right here underneath. And, you know, think about those kind of like little areas that you really want to keep the definition. So even though we're not focusing on, um, you know, the minute details, you really only want to, the, the nice thing about this is having the pink underneath because you really can't kind of make things up, right? Oftentimes when we're doing portrait, we sort of start thinking that we see things or making things up that we think we should see. With this, you kind of are quite literally painting on top of yourself. So um, you can't really make it up, right? So don't don't think that a light should be there. If it's not there, it's not there. You kind of want to kind of stick to that, and and it will come together. And you see, um, I'm almost like at this point, kind of moving that soap around a bit too, because it's you know we didn't necessarily wait for it to dry, so that's fine. That might actually help you in your subsequent layers, um, you know, to to the sort of person that was just having trouble. But you notice that I'm painting very, very thin. Now, it's a lot harder to sort of see what I have going on underneath now because um, I have a lot more kind of, of that opaque titanium white mixed in. So even though I'm adding medium and I'm painting very thin, uh, I'm starting to kind of you know, not be able to see much. Now, in the same phase where I'm kind of laying in some of those lighter, lighter areas, what I'm gonna do is kind of just quickly on the side here, mix a little bit of that lip color just so that I'm not kind of putting that in last, right? So I'm gonna go and take a little bit of my red off to the side here. Now our lips are not truly red or truly pink. So I'm gonna take some of that um, burnt umber and mix it with that red. Notice that I did not clean my brush because again, I, I really, I don't wanna mix new colors. I want everything to kind of, you know, stem from that same palette so that it, it sort of more naturally kind of breaks in there. So here I'm just gonna kind of dab Again, I'm just doing like an impression of, I'm not worrying about the exact kind of shape. Dab a little bit of that darker color, take a little bit of my white and add it to that same mix that I just made, just for a kind of softer little highlight there and just kind of add it in. Okay, notice that. So here's the other thing about the beauty of kind of um, painting our own portraits. You get to kind of decide and, and choose what kind of portrait, can you guys tell? from the portrait that I chose, what my least favorite thing to paint is on a face, my teeth. <laughs> Not because I don't have nice teeth, I just don't particularly like kind of having to lay in that kind of stark color in there. So don't think that I have like a permanent scowl. I just happen to not like to paint that area. So I made sure to take my portrait without that aspect. It's artistic license, they call it. So I'm taking a little bit of my darker color just because I'm going to kind of lay it a little bit into that lip. Now here's where you can start to kind of play around and improvise, right? So um, I'm kind of working in this layer where I'm, I'm starting to look at my print and then look at what I've kind of uh, developed and, you know, maybe wanting to kind of add a few things, deciding that I want to take that off. So I'm using my finger because, you know, that's what we do. So I'm going to take my um, paper again gonna lay it down, make sure that it's kind of registering. Applying pressure. Now, if I know that I was kind of focusing on the center bit, you know, with that sort of highlight on my forehead and around my lip and the hair, that's where I'm gonna kind of focus my pressure. I'll lift that up. So you can start seeing that really kind of develop. Okay. 
Now I'm noticing that here in this area, I'm starting to look, lose a little bit of that sort of darkness that I had laid in there. And I'm also kind of not really defining this kind of dark bit of my hair. So I'm not gonna start painting sort of dark areas just randomly. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back into my plate now and strategically start to kind of work back into those areas, okay? Now you notice what's happening is here I have this kind of large light area that hasn't very much lifted, but I'm fairly pleased with how it's kind of worked its way into there. So I'm not going to try to relift it. But again, I could have kind of sprayed that with a little bit of water or that palette uh, wetting spray. Make sure that my tape's not moving around too much. So I'm going to take my brush again. Now notice that you really don't need that crazy amount of sort of tools. I'm, I'm continuously using the same brush, just making sure that it's nice and clean. Um, and, and really that should, that should be enough. You shouldn't have to have, you know, 200 brushes for a small painting like this. So I'm gonna, I wanna work some of those darks back in, but I don't want them to become too overwhelming. So I'm actually gonna make sure that I'm using a lot of that gloss medium right now, so that I have a really transparent sort of, uh, veil of color okay i don't want to kind of you know i laid in my darks at the beginning the other thing that you want to know is you're getting a mirror image right so um i want to work in this area here and in this area here now notice that the area that i feel like i'm kind of getting blown out and, and missing a lot is not on this side even though you want to think that it's actually on the opposite side that it's printing so it's printing a mirror image okay so I'm gonna go right in here and I just feel like I'm kind of missing a bit of kind of darkness. So I'm starting to kind of focus with that violet. Sorry, Marta, we just have a question yeah. from Julia. She's wondering mm -hmm. if uh, she can do another one starting over, but yeah. keeping up with the new instructions. Yeah, for sure. I mean, so at any point, like if you want to, uh, you know, sort of, work from a new sheet. That's why we kind of supplied you with a couple sheets. Sometimes you kind of get the hang of it. So by all means, we can kind of, you can start a, another sheet and kind of catch up. Or if you feel like for your particular, uh, you know, photo that you chose working from like a lighter kind of tone to darker might work better, whatever works for you for sure. Yep. What I'm doing now is just kind of working back in. I happen to get really nice lift, but um, and some of the, the portraits that I was sort of doing kind of leading up to this demo, just to kind of see all the variables, um, you know, and what could potentially come up. Um, there was times where I was kind of doing, you know, 10 to 20 pulls, just kind of working back in light to dark, dark to light to kind of really get that, that tone that I wanted. So totally okay to use one of those other sheets and start working it in to kind of get it right. So again, um, I'm just going back in here to kind of um, really, you know, get those areas that I feel have been kind of lacking that maybe I didn't pay attention to, or I feel I just wasn't applying enough pressure. I want to make sure that I'm still kind of, you know, working in um, some of that background too. And I don't want to overdo it. So I'm going to kind of, you know, you can always, the idea is that you can always kind of pull several prints. So sometimes it's good to kind of do a, a little bit and then, uh, you know, see what, what it kind of gives you and then work another print. So don't think that you have to get everything done in one shot. And however, if anybody is sort of starting on a new sheet, don't throw away that old sheet because I'm going to show you guys different ways that you can maybe kind of play around with salvaging you know the nice thing about this is that because it's a sort of starting point you can certainly kind of take a step back take a look at it either use it as a sort of base drawing that you can then work into sort of working as you know looking at the sort of um, painting so working more directly so you see how i kind of really filled in that area there kind of uh closed out any kind of gaps that i felt i had
Does anybody feel, I mean, I feel that with this, um, with my sort of portrait, I mean, I can keep going kind of worrying about the little things, but I do feel like it's kind of come to a point where I'm, I kind of have almost max absorbency in some of those areas. Um, and, you know, aside from kind of maybe this side here, which I almost feel is, is kind of not really wanting to um, lift anymore. Um, I have a really nice kind of gestural portrait. Does anybody else feel like they've kind of gotten to a place where they like, and by all means, you don't have to go at, at my pace if you're kind of, you know, you have the sort of means and the method down. So if you're, if you're working and you're on your like 20th pool, that's perfectly okay. It's, you know, about getting to a point where you feel like you've sort of gotten a nice kind of impression. I, I like this, I was telling myself, you know, it looks humanoid. That's kind of what, what matters. Doesn't look like my dog. <laughs> Although I would have would have been nice to do dog portraits. I didn't mention in my um in my bio that I in, in you know all my spare time, because we all have so much, I also do um animal rescue. So dog portraits. I have a I quick do. request from Muriel. Um it's just wondering if you could just <laughs> lift your portrait upside down so we could take a look the other way. Oh, does that help? Are you guys seeing it backwards? It's a little, little blown out still, but up oh, there we go. We see some, seeing something come through. <laughs> Let me see how. Maybe if I bring it closer. I'm looking at it on my camera, so um, I'm trying to find like the sweet spot. I mean, is that a little bit better? You can kind of see, like you know, yeah, you can around the mask. The, yeah, I think that helps. Yeah. So again, we're not striving for sort of perfection here, right? You're getting the, the sort of gesture of a portrait. So you have the sort of hair here, you have like the kind of light that, here, let me move it over. So this kind of light that I have here in my hair, you're kind of seeing that just from me kind of laying in those colors as I was painting, that kind of bend there. Um, you have the definition around the lip. You can kind of see that shadow underneath the nose, um, the sort of arch of the eye. Yeah, that kind of seems if it's upside down and left to right, it kind of you can see it a bit better. Perfect. Thanks, Marta. <laughs> Sorry. I know it's so difficult, especially because they're still wet. So there's a bit of like a, a sort of reflection on it as well. Um, so I could sort of, you know, continue to work into that. I sort of laid in a little bit more sort of darks here. Um, you know, I can maybe play a little bit more with sort of closing out that forehead, but I think that this is a really nice sort of gesture and sometimes it's almost nice to kind of leave it where it is rather than kind of overworking something, especially with how quick this goes. Um, you can really kind of, you know, spend a good hour to kind of just pulling prints, pulling prints, pulling prints, um, which is really nice. So just to kind of show, you know, that it can kind of go, Here's a previously done one, which was done on a little bit drier paper. And you can see that the sort of coloring, oh, upside down. the coloring's a little bit sort of pale. So here you can see that it almost started to blow out a bit because there was a little bit too much titanium and I was working on too dry of a sheet. But I do have that sort of, um, sort of hair around it a little bit more developed. Here's one that was sort of started but not um, fully completed. So you can kind of stop even earlier. You have some sort of more definition in the eye there, a little bit more definition in the lip, and then everything else is left very sort of um, dark. But you can see how not kind of thinking about the surrounding does give it a bit of a floating head kind of look. Um, but again, it depends on what you're going to do subsequently, right? So let's just say that you um, kind of created one and there were some areas that you absolutely hated. You can totally work back into these with a little bit of um, sort of pen and ink. Uh, here, I kind of actually used a little bit of acrylic with a stencil to kind of mask out a shape. I don't know if you guys can see that, but I'm kind of working on top of the, leaving the areas that I enjoyed about the transfer exposed, kind of playing up some of the details and then, um, you know, masking out some others in a more abstract way. Uh, Zana is wondering if you could showcase some of them side by side there. Oh, yeah. Any particular requests? <laughs> 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 so, um, 
I'm trying to, I don't know how big, how big are my hands? Hold on, let me see. So I can kind of, this is the one that we were just working on. So you can start to see it's, it's getting a little bit more developed. Here's some that um, are sort of, you know, in different stages of development, but dry. So you can kind of get the, a sense of them better and, you know, trial and error, right? So there's certain things that I like about them, certain things that I don't. They almost have almost like a pastel -y feel because you can still see the paper through um, the paint. Um, and then here's the one that I sort of then worked back into. So again, the, the sort of definition that you see in the eyes and the nostril, that's, if you can see it sort of close up, that's actually just like cash strokes with a Windsor Newton um, uh, pen. So these are sort of Windsor Newton fine point pens in different grades. So I'm kind of working in that detail and then, you know, laying in the abstract over top. You can also, now this one is probably not gonna come through because it's very subtle on um, camera, but this one I played around with first um, sort of applying some decorative paper onto the surface. And then while it was still wet, doing the portrait over top. So you can see that in the area that I've sort of left unmasked with the paper, you're getting that portrait coming through, but it's also printing on top of the paper here. Okay, so you get like the sort of ghosting of the image. But again, just yeah. different ways to sort of play. Mm -hmm. Another question just from Marie, who's wondering yeah. um, when, when you're done all the transfers, do you ever just go in and add tape, add more paint to the paper on top of it? Just Yeah, you can definitely do that. Yep. I mean, I think that's kind of, um, you know, part of the, the sort of the, the, the nice thing about this is because it's acrylic. Well, nice thing and, and not so nice thing is that it can technically never be finished if you want it to be because acrylic you can continue to load on right like with watercolors there's a certain point where the paper becomes too oversaturated or you can't kind of rework them uh, building up on them kind of doesn't really look nice uh, with oils at a certain point you can't kind of go back you know fat over lean and all of that with acrylics you really can so you know this I think is a really nice um, place this one that we just did today is a nice sort of departure point um, so, you know, kind of working back into this now, uh, maybe even doing sort of some, letting this uh, dry a bit and then doing some washes with acrylic on top, just to kind of still maintain that kind of, you know, transparent line um, or just using it completely as uh, sort of, you know, underpainting, right? So oftentimes um, we're not very confident with kind of, you know, where the eye and the lip kind of relate to each other. So maybe this is a way for you to create an underpainting and then you finish the painting by looking at the, the image and getting that fine detail. So certainly there's no wrong way to approach this for sure, this method. Um, or landscape, you know, what if you're sort of doing a landscape and you just want to kind of get that gesture too. So it doesn't, it doesn't apply just to portraiture. So the one thing that um, I will say is that if you want to use that plastic sheet again, you definitely want to make sure that you um, clean it good. You don't want to let that dry uh, because what you'll end up getting is again, that sort of painting right on top of the acrylic plate. And I've actually, I think, while I was, I, I laid in some sort of darks and then I started talking, got distracted and I've kind of created a permanent, which is fine. I have enough of these, but you can kind of see here that I've created a permanent kind of painting on top of my surface there. So, I mean, as far as, um, you know, the, the sort of demo of how to kind of work it um, is, you know, we're kind of at a point of the end, I suppose, um, which kind of puts us right at the 3.30 mark, which gives us a good amount of time to kind of maybe do questions or, um, you know, any kind of things that you guys ran into that you want to kind of um, discuss as far as what you would do differently or, or what worked for you at your studio as opposed to what works for me in, in this sort of climate. <laughs> That's essentially what we're working against this climate. Okay, so did you wanna, we can just take everyone on mute and then- Yeah, oh. perfect. Great. Don't okay. all yell at me at the same time, okay? <laughs> <laughs> all right, here we go. All right. I think somebody raised, oh my goodness, you guys are so polite. Somebody raised their hand. Oh, 
Julia, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Let me, would you guys prefer me to have my, the camera facing me now, or do you want to still sort of look at the work area? Facing you. Yeah, I feel like sometimes engaging the person that you're talking to might be a little bit nicer. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So Julia, you had a question or a sort of feedback on, on the process? Thank you. Uh, this is Anupa. I just wanted to thank. That was an interesting process to follow. Oh, perfect. Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. I think, Julia, your mic is still muted. I'm not sure if um, if you have control over that or if Jen is still controlling oh. that. Oh, I'm just, uh, let me see. Where's Julia? There, Julia, are you good? Yeah. There Hi, it's me, Julia. Uh, before I ask you the question, I just wanted to commend you for all the um, amazing tips and uh, I really enjoyed learning from you. You made it so easy. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, and you, so um, I was curious, is there kits that are bigger that we could work on that could actually put the, the picture in and like a plastic or is this always gonna be a process where we're gonna have to take down our pictures and like, is there a special kits to buy for these things? Uh, no, I mean, so the this this sort of project is almost like combining, you know, five different techniques into one. <laughs> so I think that if you ask most printmakers, they would probably say that um, acrylic is not like the sort of preferred medium to do something like this. Traditionally, watercolor would be used for this because watercolor, as you can imagine, sort of sits on the surface for a much longer time. Um, so I don't know that you'd find a kit per se. I mean, you can probably, uh, as far as like the sort of rollers that I was using and stuff, um, that will come in like a screen or a, a printmaking kit. Uh, Speedball makes them. Um, this, both of these are actually Speedball rollers. I think that might make a huge difference in the lifting because if you imagine you're, you're applying a much more uniform uh, sort of pressure than with your palm or with a spoon. Um, but but as far as a, a complete kit, there isn't one yet. But maybe after this video, we could all be famous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I have a question. Yes. It's Judy, yeah. So can you repeat how long is the process for um, pressing the painted, for pressing the, the watercolor paper onto the painted uh, film? Sheet. Yeah. And, and rolling, how long, is there a way to, how can you tell if it's ready or not? Are there some tips? Oh. Yeah, you so I think, I think that um, the, the trick is practice, right? So even me, I have to kind of adjust myself because I'm working in a different space than I <clears> was sort of setting up for the demo. There was a slight sort of learning curve. Um, I, I would say that you, if you do the, the registration, like I showed with the tape, where you're kind of setting yourself up for, um, you know, good results, meaning that you can kind of lift it. And if you don't feel like it lifted enough, either spray it with water or palette wetting spray, or somebody mentioned a little bit of water mixed with slow dry medium, um, and then lay it back down, you can certainly do that. So even on the same plate, let's say I laid down color. I did my sort of impression. I don't feel like it lifted enough. I can lay it back down on that same plate without applying more paint, um, just by kind of trying to manipulate it. So missing it. But the key for success would be that you wanna make sure you have that nice clean registration mark. So that tape that I built up in three to four layers where it gave me just enough lift, um, you know, that will make ensure that when I'm laying it back down again, all those colors are going to hit in just the right yeah. spot that I want. Um, yeah. Yeah, as far as duration, I would say the quicker the better because the one thing you don't want is you almost want that acrylic to sort of leach onto the paper and, and the, the bond between the paper and the acrylic to be stronger than the bond between the acrylic and the plastic you're painting on. So, um, oh, sorry, we, uh, Julia's feeling brave and would like to share her. her yes. Her, oh my gosh, everybody do that. If anybody else does too, just like let us know in the chat and we will. No. Yes. <laughs> I'm so excited. Can you see me? All right. There I you can go. see you. Okay. Yes, we see you. So, so this is the picture. 
Yeah. I had a little woman um, bubble party. Um, that's why I'm wearing a wreath there. It was, yeah. And this was my first attempt. Um, I didn't have my paper wet enough. I, wow. This is only a three steps. Yep. Wow. And, and uh, it's not as good as yours. And this, the paper was oh, no, wet. Oh my gosh, stop that. And this is another three step. Um, here you go. Yeah, you're getting a great list. Yeah. Did you use, did you use the dish soap? Um, I on use, the surface? I use a uh, dish soap. It's just um, my paper would um, move because I would rub this way and my hand would move the paper, even though I put like three layers of tape to yeah. keep it. Uh, that's why I probably have blobs. I don't know. Oh. Um, yeah. Or maybe I put it too thick, the paint. But thank you I mean, again. It, Look yeah, forward to seeing so others. Much. Yeah, they look so great. Everybody, if you're please share yours. I mean, it's it's definitely really nice to see them. And I think what, what shows really nicely in Julia's is that you can get really beautiful lift of color, you know, whereas in mine, I have much more subtle lifts in color. She has really impactful lift in color. And you can kind of manipulate that with the amount of color that you're laying down. Also, mm. if you notice, um, if I'm using a little bit more of those sort of high chroma colors. So if I had a little bit more of that red in my mixes, that would sort of pull a lot more. You can notice with, um, with mine there that in those areas where I had more of that sort of uh, red, those are pulling a lot stronger. Same thing with my lips. So, um, you know, a lot of times just thinking about the pigments that you're using, right, can, can kind of affect it too. Thank you so much for sharing that, Julia. Yeah, thank you for being so brave to, to do that. That was awesome to see the results there that people were getting. And the other thing I'll mention with the moving around, um, aside from just kind of holding your finger down, there's different, like, so for example, um, you could potentially hinge your um, sort of paper. So I'll just kind of switch really quick to that camera. So if, if my paper, the problem with it a little bit is that if your paper's wet, it doesn't like to hinge. But if you had a more aggressive uh, tape, you could possibly, let's say, off over the top, right? So if I hinged it sort of on the top here and then just continuously flipped it, you would have a little bit more of um, yeah. you know, sort of precision um, using a binder clip of sorts maybe to, to achieve that. So there's different ways to play around with that, whatever works for your particular uh, setup really. Hi, this is Jerry. Um, I wanted to thank you for a really, really interesting um, meet. I'd never thought of doing anything like this before. Oh, great. I, my, my registration did not go very well because I think I didn't have enough layers of tape. So, but I got a good underpainting and now I'm oh, on top of it in acrylic, but I will try it again because it was fascinating and yours worked out so well. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the goal of this, of this demo, right? Is so that we can kind of all um, learn the technique and kind of ways to troubleshoot and then Hopefully it's inspiring enough and you have just enough of information on the process that uh, when you go back to your studio, you can really play around and also include sort of more of your style. I mean, some of you probably maybe work with a more expressive palette. Um, maybe some of you work a little bit more loose or a little bit more tight. So certainly the, the technique can be applied to, to all kinds of different ways of sort of creating this for sure. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hey. You, you can only do this technique on paper? No, you can. Um, have, you, have you tried doing it the reverse way, uh, doing it on the, on the clear sheet and then transferring it to canvas? You can transfer it to canvas. I would say that um, the reason why the, the paper works really well is because it has that sort of um, absorbency, right? So I would yeah. even say that if you use, for example, if you try to do this with just cheap newsprint, you would have a much better result, but newsprint is an archival. So that's where yeah. the problem sort of falls in. Mm -hmm. If you were to use canvas, um, I would say you would want it unstretched. So meaning that you have, you know, roll stock and then oh, stretch it. Okay. Um, because if you have it stretched, then you really can't get that good kind of, um, pressure because you're basically applying pressure against a bowing surface. Okay. Um, and then I would, I would hesitate to say that you would want a prime surface because when the canvas is primed, it's sealed, right? Mm -hmm. So, so there's nothing really that wants to kind of stick uh, to that acrylic. Um, okay. 
So, so I would say play around with it, but any surface okay. really that, that would kind of want to kind of suck up that, that acrylic for sure would work. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And great yeah. workshop, thank you. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah. That Anybody was a lot. want to share there? <laughs> I'll, share. Right. I'll share. I think Susan wanted to share. Yeah, no, it's not that I really want to share, but I will <laughs> oh, <no>. share. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'd love for you to share. I hope consecutive things get much better. I think that um, I didn't do what my damp pack wasn't damp enough to start. Mm -hmm. So I think the only thing, so original picture, but the only thing that came out were sort of the glasses. <laughs> oh, yeah. The, it's yeah. definitely leading with the glasses, but I think it's great. So, but that's you know, really nice. Yes. Amazing. And so I like that you were able to get the definition in your hair too. That's really nice. Yeah, the colors. I, you know, I'm not playing with the colors really well. And I think because it started out poorly, um, but it really excited to try it again for sure. So thank you very much. Oh, thank yeah. you. Right. Somebody else, I heard them saying they wanted to share too. I heard it. We can all like share on yeah. three too. If you guys all want to just kind of go one, two, three, share. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. I'd be okay. happy to share, but I think my video is off. Oh no. Um I'm not can... sure how to. Let Can't me start, start the video. Okay. I'm Thank gonna you. ask you to start and then okay. you should get a little thing that, that then allows you to start. Did you get that? Yeah. It says we I... can't start the video because the host has stopped it. <gasps> yeah. It's the host oh now she's asked me to start good yeah okay. i just wanted to say no i can't um, start can't start thank oh. you thank you marta it's mariel uh wherever i am on your screen um i really enjoyed i really enjoyed this mine didn't come out all that well but i think it was because i the paper wasn't as wet as it should be uh, and I, I didn't have a sprayer spray bottle and i think for me, that's obviously going to be a, 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 an important piece. Um, so, but I, I really like it, and I can see how I can uh, work it in and, and get better at it. Yeah. So, thank you. And by the way, I love your smile. So it's funny how we don't like certain things about us. <laughs> I like your smile. It's not. It's not that I don't like my smile. It's that I don't like painting it because oh. I see. <laughs> so. Um, you know, the, yeah. we often kind of, it, it gets, it's the one aspect on the face that doesn't quite like to marry with the palette. So um, yeah. I tend to kind of do a closed lip portrait, but there's, yeah. you know, if you ever do paint teeth, make sure to not just use stark white, add a little bit of that sort of, um, you know, black and umber yeah. to kind of tone that down. Nobody has curly whites like they show. No, the and, and actually <laughs> I, an art teacher told me once to be very careful painting teeth, otherwise they look like tombstones. Yes, that's yeah. right, exactly. <laughs> a mouthful of tombstones. And you know what, that's where this, this method comes in play because even if you wanted to, you would not be able to achieve tombstones because yeah, it is that, that sort of soft impression. So again, like I said in the beginning, it's actually, you know, I mean, it can be a frustrating process because you feel like you're not quite getting the detail that you're looking for, but in a sense, it's very freeing, right? Because yes. Yes. you start to really embrace the looseness of it and, and you yeah. can kind of really just appreciate the sort of gesture. Um, yeah, exactly. Or the exactly. gesture of a shadow. Mm -hmm. So thank you. I really Thank you. It. And we have so many people on camera. Does everybody want to do the one, two, three share now? No. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like if I say it enough times, I'll warm you guys up. <laughs> no, well, yes, perfect. No, everybody, no. oh, that's so great. Okay, now I can start. Right there. Oh my God, it looks worse. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. It looks Look better than, it looks better than that. <laughs> just so you know, you're going to be your own worst critic. Yes. Okay. So you were you you were saying so the just to recap, yeah. the thinner the paint, the better. So, no. Yes, I would I would say in this technique. So when we're when we're working um, in sort of you know you're kind of doing more than one impression and you're building up. I would say that working um, 
thinner with without sort of loading on the paint and then potentially doing two or three impressions is a much better way to go than kind of creating um you know a heavy layer of paint and then not being able to kind of go back um so essentially what you're doing is kind of playing and and as you start working you'll realize you know what this is a little bit too thin or this is a little bit too thick but i think finding that sweet spot um you know especially in this way so again there's there's two ways that you can i mean there's several ways that you can do this but the the way that we did was we kind of build up layers um and that allowed us to kind of work quicker so we had a better chance of it pulling if you're working alone in your studio you could certainly try kind of painting everything in and doing just one pull as well that's actually the way that the original project sheet was written by peter um but again he was sort of writing it at a time when we weren't working on Zoom in 20 different rooms, right? So, <laughs> so he had a bit more control over the temperature in the room or at least could gauge it to kind of advise in that way. So yeah. um, this, this worksheet by Peter, I don't recall seeing it or did I just miss it? Attached. It was okay. attached as an, uh, there was two attachments actually yeah. in, in the email that was sent. One was the worksheet that kind of outlines the steps and the other was a really great, um, uh, sort of outline of creating um, the palette. So it kind of helped you develop a skin tone palette for different that, skin tones. That I got, yeah. So it's, yeah, it's a, yeah. on that email. On yeah, that same there email. There's two a separate attachment. PDFs on that email. Okay, thank you. And I think maybe the first uh, mail out was just like the first page and you'll receive the fuller mm -hmm. one sort of after the demo's finished. And Jen can correct me on that. I just know that's something that yeah, we just Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we're gonna be emailing everyone two, two more emails, uh, just as follow-ups here. Mm -hmm. The first one, we're gonna give you your coupon code and announce the winner of our amazing gift set. And then the second email, once we get confirmation, um, hopefully we'll be able to provide everyone with a link for the recording so they can refer back to this video because I know oh, we have a bunch of requests for that so people can go back and watch it again and check it all out. Um, because I know sometimes when you're in the moment and you're working along, it can be yeah. hard to want to go back. Very hard to follow sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. So, <laughs> so we want to be able to do that, and we'll send you the full product or the full um, project sheets and all of that stuff again, too, just so you've got it for reference, too. Because this is such a fun thing to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to make sure that I can, what I can do better. So. Um, <laughs> and, and you guys have my email too. So any feedback, you know, even if you don't want to voice it, sort of, you know, face the face any feedback good or bad is always great because any we can all improve you know so whether it's talk slower or talk louder or <laughs> smile more whatever it is uh you know um it's i think we're helpful. we're all just kind of getting used to the new zoom yeah. realities of these I things <laughs> oh, doing this stuff in person so it's all a learning curve but i think it was super fun i think everyone i thought so yeah, yeah. I to say thank you so much for inviting me really into your homes right because um that's kind of the way that that it's all set up and i mean the you know uh, uh, even though the sort of zoom demos um are never going to compare to the sort of in-person ones i think um you know as artists we're so sort of uh you know like devoted to our craft that we'll always make things work could you have imagined if somebody asked us like at the beginning of the year what are you going to be doing in October? <laughs> you know, would you have yeah. said I'm going to be sitting in my in my home watching a demo and painting alongside an artist? I wouldn't have thought to, to say that. So, um, really, our sort of resistance as artists to kind of continue to to kind of come together and paint is is amazing, and that's kind of what makes me smile every day. So I, I really am glad that you guys joined me today and allowed me sort of into your homes. It was it was really nice. Yeah, thank you. And I just want to say thanks from the above ground team for everybody for joining and um, making this such a fun event. Really, we appreciate it. So thanks yes. a lot, Marta. And thank thanks you. to everyone who came. Thank you, thank you Marta. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So I think that's Thank, you. thank you. You guys are the best. <laughs> <laughs> Jen, did you have any final details on the um the sort of discount code or anything like that? I'm and then I'll email that over to everyone, but just so you guys okay. know it is usable in store and online um for gallery acrylics. So you're gonna be able to save on the whole range there, whatever, whatever okay. we've got. And that'll include mediums too as well. So. Oh, okay. Great. And then if Thank you guys you. want to follow our um artists uh on Instagram, if you're on Instagram, you can um Go on TFAC NA for North America, that's T F A C N A. And we often have short little videos that are put together for different techniques. 
um, and all of the sort of Windsor Newton and Liquitex products. So you can kind of gain insight um, and they're very short. So they're perfect yeah. for that kind of Instagram attention span. <laughs> yeah, if you're, yeah, if you're on Instagram, they do a lot of great Instagram live yeah. demos there as well to follow yeah. along with. Can you, yeah, spell, really can you spell that? What's TFAC and A? So what? TFAC, it stands for the Fine Art Collective. So it's T F A C, and then N A for oh. North America. I'm just oh, but N, I have, okay. N A, good. Yeah. Although N -A. you can follow the other ones too. There's a UK. There's an Australia. But we're the best. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It was really, it was really good to see yeah. you guys. And feel free to email me with any questions as you're kind of working the the projects. If something comes up that's not in the video or something like that, my email's fully on that on that chain and I always respond. So um, okay. I'd love to hear from you guys. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good great weekend. Yes, you too. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank Bye. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Bye.